Welcome and thank you for being here. Um, it's thanks to the Sheboygan uh, County Historical Museum for hosting us. Uh, it's great to be here in Sheboygan. It's one of my favorite towns, perched on the big lake. It's culturally, historically rich town, and I just love to visit Sheboygan. <clears throat> well, we're here tonight to talk about my book, Wisconsin State Parks, Extraordinary Stories of Geology and Natural History, published by the Wisconsin Historical Society Press. And before we start that, I want to take a minute to further what Chloe said and thank my wife, Gail, who's here with us tonight. Uh, I wouldn't be here, likely, if it wasn't for all the help, invaluable help I got from Gail in, in terms of ideas and research and coaching and managing. And so uh, I want to thank, give special thanks to Gail. And we already applauded the treats, so. <laughs> <clears throat> well, who here has a favorite state park? Just shout out a, a few state parks, your favorites. Peninsula, Peninsula State Park. Devil's Lake. Colorado Andre. Andre down the shore. And Wyalusing over on the Mississippi. Uh, what, what is it about those parks that makes them your favorite park? Just a, just a few two or three word answers to that question. Why is it your favorite park? It's pretty. It's pretty. They're beautiful, the parks. Quiet. Quiet. Solitude. Peace and quiet. Um, all kinds of reasons why people love the state parks. Uh, they receive millions of visitors every year. And this evening we're going to look a little deeper into why the parks are so beautiful. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about the book and then we'll follow that with some time for questions. And then you can grab some treats and, uh, and I can sign some copies of the book if you wish. Well, when it comes to state parks and other beautiful places that I like to visit, uh, what drives me is the desire to know them better, to understand what made them, what they are. Uh, like you, I've enjoyed exploring and learning about the parks, what, what makes them the way they are. I, was, I grew up in the northwestern part of Wisconsin. I was lucky to have parents who got me into the woods to explore as often as they could get me out. And I remember one time in particular when I was pretty little, um, we went on a hike in the woods in a, south of Ashland, Wisconsin, uh, the far northern part of the state. And we went in on a trail um, into the woods. Soon started hearing the sound of rushing water. And it got louder as we hiked along. And we rounded one bend in the trail. And there was beautiful little park, Morgan Falls uh, County Park. It's a beautiful little secluded waterfall in the far north deep woods. And I dedicated the book to my parents because it was experiences like this that sparked my desire to know the stories of such places. And Gail and I have carried on the tradition, taking our kids to the places we love to explore, like Devil's Lake State Park. Now, those are my kids, Will and Katie. Now, since the photo was taken, we've all grown up, I guess. Um, <laughs> but it was ex these experiences, family experiences and others, that shaped my career as a science writer. One thing that caught my eye a few years ago was this beautiful map published by the uh, Wisconsin Geological and Natural History Survey. It does a fabulous job of showing the variety of landscapes that we have right here in Wisconsin, including the, the deep woods of the north, uh, the cliffs of Door County, um, just up the, up the shore from us here, the uh, central sand plain with its buttes and spires and mounds of sandstone, and the driftless area of the southwest with its deep valleys and river bluffs. Uh, that's Gail in the photo there. She's checking out a feature at Wyalusing State Park called the Keyhole. And so it occurred to me that to explore any one of these areas in the state, to zoom in and explore, one could use the wonderful state parks and forests of the state as, as entry points. We can think of the state parks and state forests as time portals or gateways to the ancient past. And that idea really intrigued me. So I decided that by going to the parks, exploring, learning their stories, and telling them in a book, I could share my fascination with the about the geology and natural history of our state. So let's take a uh, look at the book and talk about how you might use it next time you go to a park. And later we'll take a brief tour of nearby uh, Kohler Andre State Park. Uh, but 
First, I want to, inter I want to mention the first chapter in the book. Um, it, it tells the bigger geologic story of the Wisconsin region. Uh, now, if you're, if you're uh, already a Wisconsin geology expert or well-versed, you may not need this chapter. But for, for those of us who are not, it gives a good overview of Wisconsin geology and introduces you to some key concepts that will help you to fully appreciate the park stories. <clears throat> and one of those concepts is the immense time scale covered in the book. Um, I ask you to take yourselves out of our daily time frame that we divide into hours and minutes and seconds and to shift into that much larger frame that geologists know so well, measured in centuries and millennia, millions and billions of years. Um, there are five spans of time that we focus on briefly here, uh, just to set the stage. Uh, the first is the Precambrian, the first four billion of the Earth's four and a half billion year history. And, uh, it involved uh, continental collisions that formed North America, and in what would become Wisconsin, uh, it, it involved uh, mountain, mountain building. <clears throat> uh, next is the 50, billion, 50 million year Cambrian period, uh, a time when seas invaded our continent and life began to evolve in those seas. Now, there had been seas in the Precambrian. Um, more than one probably that invaded our area and had some forms of primitive microbial life in them. But the Cambrian seas, as far as we know, were the first ones to host complex multicellular life forms and to kick off the evolution of life in those seas. Uh, the next, the third period is the next roughly 135 million years following the Cambrian in which more seas advanced, or advanced into our area and Life in those seas, evolution of life really took off during the, that, that next period. The next period is roughly 400 million years following the departure of the last sea that entered our area. And during that time, erosion took over and wiped out the fossil record for all of that time. So for example, we do not know for sure if dinosaurs ever roamed in the famous Jurassic they probably did, but we have no fossil record of dinosaurs because that, that, um, the erosion really wiped it out, especially in Wisconsin. And finally, the two and a half million year quaternary period, the, the ice age, time of the glaciers, and within the last 200,000 years, the emergence of humans. Another key idea for understanding the park stories, as well as we can, is to, to, to know that the Wisconsin region, for much of its history, was tropical. Um, I want to thank the UW Press for the use of this image. Uh, it was used by David Michelson and his co-authors in their great book, Geology of the Ice Age National Scenic Trail. I don't know if any of you are familiar with that. It's a great, great book. Um, long ago, <coughs> Early in its history, the Earth's crust was fractured into several large pieces called plates that were jostled and moved around on the planet like bumper cars in an amusement park. And uh, the, the movement of these plates is called plate tectonics. The plate on which Wisconsin rode, the North American plate, in Precambrian time was south of the equator. And due to plate tectonics, it took kind of a curly Q path over time crossed the equator heading north about 350 million years ago and kept shifting around and landed where it is now about 10 million years ago. But we're still moving, as you may know. Um, uh, the North American plate is uh, shifting roughly southwest about as fast as our fingernails are growing. So not, not very fast. Um, <clears throat> Beyond chapter one, uh, my book is organized uh, into five by five regions uh, with a chapter for each region. Now, every one of Wisconsin's 49 state parks and 10 state forests has a great story to tell. But I picked this, this, the five or six stories in each region that best represent the dynamic processes that occurred there. Uh, 
so let's just take a quick tour of the regions before we go to Kola Andre. Uh, the first is in, in the northwest corner of the state. Uh, the, uh, the, the bedrock up there is largely volcanic. Uh, that's Brownstone Falls up at Copper Falls State Park. And the, uh, the, the rock all around and under those falls is, is volcanic. In the northeast corner of the state, the parks lie on uh, the remains of ancient sea creatures and sea plants that were converted to hard stone, hard, hard rock, and later unearthed by the glaciers and other processes, uh, forming features like these cliffs that make Door County famous, this one at Peninsula State Park. And here in the southeast corner of the state, the rolling countryside is formed by glaciers, uh, molded, molded features such as this came or cone-shaped hill at the Kettle Moraine State Forest. In the south central region of the state where Gail and I live, uh, a variety of processes shaped the features, uh, many of them related to the glacier. For example, um, even in this, even during glacial times, during the short summer months, water would flow into the cracks and crevices of rock. And then during the long, cold winters, that water would freeze and expand and gradually pry rock pieces apart, one from another. Uh, and over centuries, this freeze-thaw cycle with its pickaxe effect literally sculpted features such as the balanced rock at Devil's Lake State Park. And finally, in the southwest corner of the state, the driftless area, never invaded by glaciers, the slow, steady process of erosion formed features such as Eni Point at Governor Dodge State Park. Uh, it's a sandstone mass sculpted by wind and water erosion, uninterrupted for hundreds of millions of years. And that's my son, Will, in the photo there. He was helping me with, with, with pictures that day. Now, each uh, park story in the book has an introduction with uh, more details on the geology and natural history of the park area. In many cases, I also include some early human history, explaining how Native Americans uh, lived in the park areas and why they, too, regarded them as special or even sacred. For example, this is uh, Trempolo Mountain up at Perot State Park on the Mississippi. Uh, and this, this, this has uh, long been regarded as sacred by the Ho-Chunk, and so access to it is restricted in honor of that. Each story includes uh, photos, like some of those you're seeing here tonight. And I took all but a couple of the photos in the book on my hikes in the parks. And each uh, story is also accompanied by one or more trail guides that I wrote up after hiking those trails. Uh, they, they preview for you what you will see on the trail, like uh, rock, f rock types and rock formations, uh, how things have changed over time, how they're changing now. You can think of a trail guide as, as one of those audio recordings you can listen to when you walk through a museum, and it helps you understand what you're looking at. <coughs> also note that the editors at the press designed this book specifically to fit into a backpack. So you can grab a, a, a park trail map and put the book in your backpack and hit the trails and play geologist. So let's do that now. Let's go through one of those time portals and see how you can use the book uh, when you explore the parks. We are going on a hike through Kettle Moraine State Park. Uh, just down the shore from here, um, what we'll see when we walk through this park is an extraordinary a set of extraordinary processes, including uh, invasions by ancient seas that laid down thick layers of sandstone and dolomite, uh, rivers uh, flowing and eroding that stone for millions of years, crushing glaciers that gouged out the, uh, the, the, the Great Lakes basins, and the building grain by grain of expansive sand dunes, and finally the uh, f the growth of stately dune forests. Kola Andre uh, State Park is known for sprawling beach, sp sprawling sand dunes and inviting beaches. Now here, I want to take a minute to 
uh, give special thanks to the friends of Colorandre State Park. And I bet we've got a few of them here tonight. Anybody? Friends of Colorandre? All right. Great. Those, we owe those people a special debt to, for the hard work they've done to make Colorandre State Park what it is. Uh, which is a wonderful place to, to study and learn about ecosystems, dune ecosystems, and how they form. And I'll talk more about the dune formation later on. Uh, but to get to the beginning of this story, we have to step back in time about two billion years um, to a time when, mount oops, sorry, when mountains stood in uh, northern Wisconsin. Um, they were heaved up when two primitive continents collided about 1.9 billion years ago to form a, a, the new continent of North America. Remember, this region was tropical at the time, so those mountains were desert-like. They were sandy, and uh, I'm sorry, uh, tropical and desert-like. Um, and they might have resembled these peaks that you can see now uh, at uh, uh, Big Bend National Park in Texas. So what do these old mountains to the north have to do with the dunes at Colorandre State Park? Well, have you ever wondered where all the sand along the lakes, the Lake Michigan shore comes from? Well, uh, much of it comes from those mountains to the north that were, uh, that were there almost two billion years ago, beginning at that time. Uh, over millions of years, winds scoured those highlands and streams and rivers brought the eroded sand and gravel down to, to seashores that, uh, to the shores of, of invading seas that were coming into the area from the south. And those ancient seashores might have looked something like this mud flat now on the east coast of the United States. Over time, several seas invaded and retreated. And the streams that flowed to those seashores deposited a deep layers of sand. Um, and as the sea would advance and would cover the shore, uh, that sand would be buried eventually by sediments and, and eventually com uh, cemented into sandstone. And then when a sea retreated, that sandstone would eventually be exposed and eroded again into sand. And as those ancient seas advanced and retreated several times over hundreds of millions of years, uh, this cycle repeated itself again and again. And that's where much of that sand on the lake shores comes from. As time went by, um, life began to evolve rapidly in these seas that invaded our area. In Silurian time, about 450 million years ago, a seafloor probably looked a lot like this, just teeming with life. Uh, this is a diorama uh, on display in the Milwaukee Public Museum, representing uh, one, of the planet, one of the planet's first coral reefs right here in southeastern Wisconsin. And the life there included uh, a variety of creatures clinging uh, brachiopods and crawling trilobites. Uh, these tall flower-like things called crinoids or sea lilies were actually animals. And the chief predator in this system was this octopus type critter, the cephalopod. And some of these guys got to be very, very large, up to 30 feet long, they figure. The remains of such creatures uh, collected on the seafloor for 300 million years or more and eventually became limestone, which was then converted by undersea chemical uh, reactions to dolomite, uh, a harder, more resistant cousin to, to limestone. And when the last of the ancient seas had departed our area, uh, this dolomite covered all of Wisconsin in layers up to 600 feet thick. Um, but over the next 400 million years, that long period of erosion, much of it was carried away by wind, water, and ice erosion. In eastern Wisconsin, however, much of the dolomite remained, as you probably know, and today it forms the ridges and cliffs called escarpments. 
the most famous of which is called the Niagara Escarpment. And it's most dramatically represented um, at the cliffs of, uh, up, up on the cliffs of Door County, this one at Peninsula State Park. The, uh, <clears throat> the Niagara Escarpment runs from southeastern Wisconsin down below uh, Lake Winnebago, south of Lake Winnebago, up through Door County where it forms the backbone of the Door Peninsula. And as you might know, it's called the Niagara Escarpment because it connects us to Niagara Falls. To the east of us uh, is the Michigan Basin, which contains Lake Michigan, Lower Peninsula of Michigan, and most of Lake Huron. And the escarpment, the Niagara Escarpment, rims that basin, represented by this red line. It's mostly eroded, or largely eroded and buried, but it outcrops in a lot of different places, including the northeast corner of Lake Winnebago, all, all along the, uh, the uh, Door Peninsula, and most famously on the border of Niagara, of New York, and uh, Ontario, where the Niagara River thunders over the escarpment at Niagara Falls. Uh, now, in many areas of the Lake Michigan shore, the dolomite mantle has been eroded away, exposing underlying layers of sandstone and lots of sand. Uh, from here in Sheboygan, um, right there, uh, the, the escarpment is to the west. It's uh, largely buried under uh, glacial drift. Um, it's over in the region of, of Lake Winnebago. <clears throat> but around Cora Andre State Park, uh, it's sand, sand, and more sand. And again, that sand originally, or much of it came from those mountains that stood to the north one and a half billion years ago. Now for the next part of the glacial, uh, geologic story uh, about the park, let's skip ahead to glacial times. Uh, there were several um, glaciers during the roughly two and a half million year quaternary period. Uh, some geologists think that as many as 15 major ice sheets came creeping down out of Canada. The most recent one is called the Wisconsin glaciation because our state contains some of the best examples in the world of what a glacier can do to the landscape. Each of those ice masses plowed up more of the underlying sandstone and sand pulverizing it and spreading a layer of sand across the Lake Michigan basin. And as each glacier uh, retreated, streams gushed off of those glaciers and out from under the withering ice mass and, and deposited tons of sand and gravel in what is called outwash, and that too added to the uh, sand and gravel that's in the, the basin. Over the thousands of years since the glass glacier retreated, uh, Lake Michigan's level has risen and fallen several times, and this too has played a role in the formation of the sand dunes. As the glacier was retreating from Wisconsin, uh, meltwater pooled in low areas forming glacial lakes, lakes that were bound on one or more sides by a retreating wall of ice. And one of them was Lake Algonquin, which uh, about 12,000 years ago covered all of today's Lake Michigan and Lake Huron uh, basins. At its deepest, uh, Lake Algonquin covered the Colorado State Park area, including Sheboygan, right around in here, uh, submerging them under 20 to 30 feet of icy water, ice cold water. Uh, the lake's currents and waves, the glacial lake's currents and waves, continue to shift loads of sand onto what would become today's beaches. Now the left side of this image shows uh, Lake Algonquin uh, about 12,000 years ago. Note that it's bigger than current day Lake Michigan, which is outlined uh, in this dark black line here. Um, then about 8,000 years ago, the re retreating uh, glacier uh, uncovered an, out an outlet uh, for water to drain to the northeast. So a lot of that water drained away. And the lake level then dropped as much as 300 feet below current levels, which would have put Sheboygan pretty far inland from the lake. 
Uh, now, glaciers are so massive that they actually compress the land. Uh, and, uh, so as a glacier melted, that compressed land slowly began to rebound and rise up. And eventually, it raised that northeast uh, outlet enough to close it off. And then water again began to, the, the lake level again began to rise. And by about 5,500 years ago, another version of the lake called uh, Lake Nipissing uh, had again put uh, the Kohler Andre State Park in Sheboygan area under about 15 to 20 feet of water. That was 5,500 years ago. Today, you can find evidence of those ancient beaches uh, in, on many areas of, of the Lake Michigan shore. Uh, here's a photo of an ancient abandoned lakeshore cliff in the woods up at Newport State Park uh, on the north end of the Door Peninsula. Uh, so when the lake, when the last glacier had gone and the, the last glacial lake drained away, Lake Michigan was ringed by a deep mass of sand, the, the deep mass of sand that you see today being molded into dunes like these at Kohler Andre State Park. <clears throat> when you visit Kohler Andre, if the wind is blowing the right way, you can find a sandy area near the shore and watch what the wind does to the sand. A reading from my Kohler Andre story explains this further. First note that the waves are bringing sand to the shore where winds dry it and blow it further inland. If you watch closely, you might see windblown grains of sand landing on the leeward side of a piece of driftwood or a bush uh, growing near the shore. Watch long enough and you will see these grains adding up to a small pile that becomes larger with continuing wind. And you will be witnessing the birth of a sand dune. And uh, my book goes on to explain that the growth of the sand dune is a slow, delicate process. Grain by grain, wind-blown sand builds, up, builds a pile uh, which itself becomes subject to the wind. Um, it, the pile mounts up asymmetrically like a water wave with a sloping westward, uh, windward side and a steeper leeward side. And eventually it gets big enough so that a tiny avalanche occurs, occurs on that steeper side. And this moves the pile of sand a few inches inland. And in this way, by avalanching, a dune slowly migrates inland while a new dune beginning forming dune takes its place down by the shore. And as successive dunes form, the deeper, older inland dunes are shielded from the wind by the younger dunes near the lake. And with sands on the older dunes shifting less, uh, certain plants can take hold on the surfaces. First come grasses, uh, and then later more complex plants like creeping juniper, and eventually uh, shrubs and, and trees. And uh, in this way, by plant succession, uh, forests can be developed on old dunes. <clears throat> and it surprised me to learn that, that uh, wetlands can even appear on dunes. Uh, under certain circumstances, winds can scour away enough sand to expose the water table. And then groundwater seeps to the surface, creating a place where sedges and grasses can grow. Other plants soon find that area, and, and they, as they grow, die, and decay, soil is formed, and a shallow marsh called a slack develops. Uh, another feature of the dunescape is called a sand blow. It occurs where the plant covering a, on a younger dune is uprooted, and uh, the sand is then exposed to winds that create an ever-widening barren area. And this can threaten a dune ecosystem. Uh, human activities such as walking or climbing on the dunes, building a fire there, letting a dog dig too much in the sand, uh, these kinds of things can cause that kind of damage that starts a sand blow. At Kohler Andre State Park, the network of dune, of cord walks, sorry, was built to preserve the dune ecosystem by guiding visitors around and away from those sensitive areas. 
Now, all of these, as all of these features were beginning to form, as the last glacier was retreating to the north, around 11,000 years ago, Native American people began to inhabit the ancient lake shores. First came the nomadic uh, Paleo Indians, who hunted the mastodon and other big game along the, the shores of Lake Algonquin. By 5,500 years ago, groups of archaic Indians, uh, including copper culture people, were fishing Lake Nipissing's waters, uh, using spears and nets, as well as hunting deer, uh, bear, and smaller game in the, in the dune forests. Uh, about 3,500 years ago, early woodland tribes added gardening to their survival strategies, raising corn, beans, squash, and gourds, and living in villages. Um, this is a replica of a dwelling in a village uh, uh, that's uh, built by late woodland people between 1100 and 1500 years ago. And this is on display at Whitefish Dunes State Park, north of here. Now, as I said before, through the amazing process of plant succession, uh, forests can actually take hold on sand dunes. I, I, f I find that amazing. Uh, and what makes it even more so is that Kohler Andrews <laughs> Andre State Park hosts an unexpected and unusually diverse combination of forest types. I'll do another reading from my book to sum up that story. Today, Kohler Andre State Park uh, features fledgling dunes, thick dune forests, and every phase of dune development between those extremes. The park lies in what ecologists call the tension zone, a band of terrain running southeasterly across the central part of the state that represents the transition between northern and southern forest types. Many northern forest type trees grow in the park because the moist, calm, cool conditions created by the Big Lake are similar to those found in the northern forests. The trees include white and red pine, yellow and white birch, and certain oak species. The southern forest type is represented in the park by beech, green ash, balsam poplar, cottonwood, and black walnut. And uh, you can, you, uh, so that's another reason this park is interesting to me. It, it, it straddles the tension zone. For excellent uh, detailed information on all aspects of the park, uh, you can visit this Sanderling Nature Center on the shore there at the park. The Creeping Juniper Nature Trail Loop departs from and comes back to the Nature Center, serves as a kind of an outdoor extension of the Nature Center. It's well worth the effort to take this little half mile hike. It's just loaded with information about flora and fauna and the history of the park area. It provides uh, one more way to realize what a treasure Kohler Andre State Park is. Uh, it's uh, a beautifully preserved dune environment where you can enrich your soul by uh, sunning on a Lake Michigan beach, hiking through a fragrant dune forest, or exploring among ancient dunes. Well, thank you. Now I'd love to hear your, your questions if you have them, and then uh, when we're done, grab some refreshments, and you can, I can sign copies of the book if you wish. Over there, in addition to what the library folks provided us, as you know, Gail, brought some crunchy trilobites and brachiopods. They're, they're ancient, but they're really tasty, so. <laughs> Any questions? Yes? Yeah, it's a question I get a lot. I like the question, but it's hard to answer because, you know, it's like being asked who your favorite child is. I've gotten to love them all for various reasons. But if you push me a little bit, I will say uh, Copper Falls State Park. It's kind of up in my own stomping grounds up there in the northwest. And it feels, when you walk through the gates of that place, you feel, feel like you've walked back in time 100 million years. So that's my favorite. 
Anybody else? Yes? The mineral deposits that are found, or deposits that are found up in northern Wisconsin, around Michigan, uh -huh. was that put there by the volcanoes? Um, that was put there by volcanic action. Uh, have you ever heard of the Mid-Continent Rift? It was, a, it was an opening up of the continent right up, right up there, right up through what would become the Lake Superior, um, axis of Lake Superior Basin. And a, a 1 in 1.1 billion years ago that opened up, a big plume of magma came up and just pried open a crack in the earth. And it was beginning to tear the continent in half like the, the rift in, in Africa is now, East Africa. Uh, something pushed that rift back together, but during, and took the whole process took 50 million years or something from the time it started opening to when it started closing. All that time, lava was spurting up out of that crevice or rift. And uh, it was not like explosive volcanoes, although there were some of those up there too. But this slow emergence of basaltic lava spread this layer of basalt across all of northwestern Wisconsin. And... Um, <clears throat> brought with it from deep in the earth deposits of copper, silver, uh, a few other minerals up there. That's where the rich copper deposits came from. There are no uh, uh, indications of vents of volcanoes remaining up in that area, are there? Like that's one kind of no, no vents that I know of. The question is, sorry, the question is, uh, are there vents, are there indications of vents of volcanoes up in the far north? Um, and I don't believe there are indications of vents. There's, there's, indi there's evidence of the rift, and then there's the, the type of rock that you see on that, that slide that I showed of brownstone falls. That's red, what they call red lava. Some people call it red lava. I don't think that's the geologic term for it, but that is, you know, <laughs> that, is, that is volcanic, though. If I, that, I, take that, I have read that they take that to mean an, explo an explosive volcano occurred in that area, that red lava rock. That's what I understand. So correct me if I'm wrong. Yes? I have a place up in Iron County just south of Hurley, Kyle Flows area. And there's a couple of uh, trails that are local. So there's a couple of rocks that are half the size of a car with little rocks in them. They said those blue from the volcano yeah. in Superior. Uh -huh. And this is the big rock sitting on one of the trails. Sure. So I told them, is that... There, are, there, there were some explosive volcanoes along the rift. You know, they figure that they were scattered around explosive volcanoes. They know that one occurred around Copper Falls because of that red rock. And you, you said yours is places where? I'm just south of Hurley. South of Hurley? North, north of the Turtle Flamble. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I believe so that. Yeah, not too far from Ashland. Yeah, I believe that's right. I believe that would have been another area. The time period was? The rift was 1.1 billion to... Uh, a, a one billion or something like that. It was no, it wasn't that long. Yeah, it was the the yeah during that period. Now I forgot to mention the iron deposits in 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 response to the other question about mineral deposits. Iron came from a much earlier process. That was back one of the Precambrian seas, more like two billion years ago. Uh, the atmosphere changed, and this is how they figure the atmosphere changed because that iron precipitated out of whatever ocean was was there at the time and, and deposited along the shore and was buried in those sands and eventually buried deep. And that's where the iron came from. But that was a much older deposit. So, yes? Do you know how many state parks Wisconsin has? Yeah, the question is how many state parks does Wisconsin have? There are 49 state parks, 10 state forests. And then there's a whole bunch of things called state um, recreation areas that are some of them are a lot like state parks and of course there's seven or eight hundred state natural areas which are not parks but they're areas that are preserved in various states for for study and so on yes that is a good question um, what makes a park versus a forest? It it kind of comes. There's a it's a mix of politics and and budgetary <laughs> budgetary politics. Um, now let me think. Which state forest? Um, Point Beach State Forest. They wanted to make that a state park, 
but I think it was that one, one of the state forests. But because it was owned by another part of the state, it, it wasn't owned by the DNR, I think. I, I'm sorry, I can't give you the specifics, but it was kind of determined by who owned what. <laughs> and then there was the you know, squabbling among the people in the government to turn it into a state park or a state forest. It wasn't squabbling, but you know, negotiation or, or just rules, I guess. So some things are state forests, and they're almost like state parks, and something like Kettle Moraine is almost like a state park, and some, some state parks are more like state forests. But So it's really a, a distinction more of uh, artificial than real. So. Does your state park get you into all of Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The SRAs, the state recreation areas, all of those, all the state-owned properties. Mm. Yes? I get that question. I, I'm asked if, there, if I think there will be any more state parks. And I keep meaning to look into that to see if there's anything brewing. I don't know of anything. I'd love to see a state park up in the northeast part of the state where all those waterfalls are in Marinette County. I don't know if you're familiar with those. But there's some beautiful, astounding, beautiful state uh, waterfalls up there. And there could, could be a state park up there. A lot of the state parks came from land donated by wealthy individuals who said, I want this to be a park. And they gave it to the state. You know, that was Perot was that way. Uh, um, uh, Patterson up on the, on the, the superiors was Corandre. Yeah, exactly. And uh, yeah, Tommy Thompson. And, and also, um, they are also sometimes formed by kind of. Uh, Grassroots efforts. Uh, I, I think this is. I think this is pretty pretty well true. The the interstate park, the very first park that Wisconsin ever established, was developed largely due to a, a grassroots effort to preserve. And it was Minnesota and Wisconsin working together. I'm trying to think of another example of a of a park that was organized by people. But I'm sorry, I can't think of it right now. But yes. Have you been down to the Oh, yes. Oh, sure. That's Gail's favorite park. Where's yeah. Gail? <laughs> That's her favorite. Have you ever been over across on Iowa side, and there's a high point that you can look out, and you can see the Wisconsin River yeah. coming into the Mississippi there? Yes. It's a beautiful place. Yeah. Uh, Iowa, yeah. I, yeah. On the I, greater Iowa, it's not very far from Perch. Yeah, it's right across the river. I have been there a long time ago. I need to go back again. It's very pretty. We were just there last summer, I guess it was. Yeah. And it is, I'm originally from that part of the Oh, county. from Iowa. I, I lived uh, down right on the Wisconsin River. Oh. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, well, Iowa's a beautiful park. Anyone else? Yes? Yeah, um, you divided the state into five sections. Yeah. Um, I have the Northwest Copper Falls is volcanic, and the uh, Eastern uh, Peninsula State Park is Dolomite. Yeah. And then the Southwest was Driftless. Yes. Okay, and then Southeast, I don't have what it was, and I don't have what the other. So. Oh, sure. Southeast, I, I said that it was for, the landforms were molded by glacier. The southeastern part of the state here is mostly glacially formed. And then South Central was kind of a mishmash because there's a whole bunch of state parks right in that area north of Madison, Devil's Lake, Mirror Lake, uh, Tower Hill, um, Natural Bridge, whole cluster of parks, beautiful little parks. And some of them are in the Driftless area, some are out of it, but they're all affected by the glaciers. So that's kind of how I characterize the South Central parks is formed by a variety of processes, including glaciers. Sure. Uh, oh, and one other thing I want to mention in that regard, um, Rib Mountain is kind of a tricky one. I couldn't figure out what to do with Rib Mountain. It, it would fit in a lot of different, it's a beautiful park, it would fit in a lot of different um, categories, but it, I put it in with the, the Northeast because it's on really, really hard rock that, that um, uh, blanking, I'm blanking on it now, the rock that... No, well, granite is is part of is is part of the Mosinee Hills and 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 others nearby. Um, um, oh, what's the one? What is, what is the rock at Devil's Lake? 
Quartzite, quartzite, quartzite. <laughs> quartzite is, is largely what um, makes up um, um, uh, Rib Mountain because it was heaved up above the granite, the ancient granite. So anyway, that's, that's an interesting part too. Anyone else? Yes? Sure. Uh, Trempolo is uh, part of Perot State Park. Um, Perot is a little isolated uh, cluster of peaks that were formed in the same manner as the rest of the Driftless area. And they were once part, Trempolo and the rest of those peaks at Perot were once part of the Minnesota side of the Driftless. The, the, the Mississippi River came down flowed uh, north of Trempolo and then east of Perot uh, State Park and then continued in its track it's in now. But um, the uh, Trempolo River came down out of those hills on the Wisconsin side, brought a lot of sand and gravel, and formed a natural dam across the Mississippi and diverted the water into some tributaries behind, what, be, sort of behind Perot State Park peaks and isolated them from the Minnesota side, and they had already been isolated from the Wisconsin side by the broad Mississippi River Valley. So it's this little group of stranded peaks. I refer to them in the book as stranded peaks. And Trempolo is um, the highest island, the biggest island in the Mississippi, I believe. It's an island, and uh, it's surrounded by the Trempolo River and the backwaters of the Mississippi. Sacred ground to the Ho Chunk, um, pretty high. It's 380 feet off the river, river uh, level, I believe. Uh, anything else that you're wondering about about Trempolo Mountain? It's it's got trails on it, and I I'm not sure. I have to double check on this. It used to be that you couldn't just go there without a ranger to guide you around because it was sacred ground to the Ho Chunk, and they didn't want people tramping all over it. So anyway. Yes. Yep. Yep. Trempolo. Yep. Great little town. I don't think I've ever been to that state park. Oh, it's real pretty. Go through Trempolo and go up the river about a mile on the road up the river there, and it's right there. Go cool. see it. <laughs> yes. When you were talking about ancient ancient seas covering this area, how? How much of the state did those cover? The entire state up? Yeah, the whole state was underwater a lot of the time. Uh, I think there's a, there are some geologists who believe that in the northern, very northwest cor most corner of the state wasn't covered much of the time. But, um, but yeah, it was covered many times. The whole state was covered many times. And that's why we had such thick layers of dolomite all over the state when the last of the seas finally flowed away. Yes? What creates a drumlin or an esker? A drumlin or an esker? Oh, great questions. Um, go to, go to uh, if you have time, go to Kettle Moraine and you'll learn, learn a lot about that. Have you been there? Kettle Moraine State Forest? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, drumlin is, um, that's one of the, uh, I'll go with esker first. An esker is what's left of an underground, uh, under ice stream, a stream that was flowing along under the ice um, as it was melting. And um, it was pretty much perpendicular to the to the wall to the front, the ice front, the wall, the margin of the glacier. Glacier, and the stream would come down out of the out from under the uh, the glacier and flow out. It would be carrying sand and gravel that were embedded in the glacier and melting out. And it would each stream would would um, just drop a, a, a whole load of sand and gravel along its bed. And then as the, it would basically fill up the, the tunnel that was formed by the stream under the ice. And, and when the glacier finally melted away, what was left was this sinuous ridge of, of sand and gravel. And that's an esker. Some of them are huge. Some of them are, you know, 100 feet up off the ground. And some beautiful samples of that in uh, Kettle Moraine. Um, the drumlin, it, it took the glacier, glaciologists a while to figure out what formed drumlins, and I think there might even still be some argument about it, but the best explanation, is, as I understand it, according to David Michelson and others who've studied this, is that um, 
you know, under a glacier, parts, some areas of the ground were frozen really hard and some were a little softer and wetter. And so where the ice and the, and the ground under it were rock hard, as the glacier moved over that area, wait now, let me think about this. The ground, the ground was hard. The ground was frozen solid, deep. And as the glacier came plowing along, it plowed away the softer, wetter stuff. And when it ran into one of those chunks of really frozen, hard soil, it just kind of went up and over it like that. So it was carved by an advancing glacier. And a drumlin, in case anybody doesn't know, is a teardrop-shaped hill. It's it, it, the, if you look at or a spoon, a teardrop at the end of a spoon, the blunt end of the spoon or teardrop is where the glacier came and went up over, and then it tapered off the back end to make it look like the back of the spoon. And, and that's where drumlins came from. The state capitol is sitting on a drumlin. Uh, Babcock, is it Babcock Hill? The hill yeah. overlooking Lake Mendota, that's a drumlin. A lot of drumlins in the Madison area. And Sure, yeah. And over here, there's many drumlin fields. Did I answer your question? Did I answer? Okay. Yes? Uh, global warming is mm -hmm. raising the seas. What is going to happen in the lakes as far as we know that the, the seas are going to be raising? But what about the lakes? What happens there? I don't think that uh, climate change would make much difference to the to the, the lake level, I, I shouldn't say that because I haven't studied it, but the, the seas are, are going to be rising because there's this enormous body of water in the ocean is expanding because the water's heating up as well as the atmosphere. So just a, just a little bit of heat in the ocean it, and all that water expands, it makes a difference on the seashore. And, uh, and the other reason is because ice is melting off the land and adding to the water in the oceans. Um, the lakes... Uh, there's not, the Great Lakes, there isn't a lot of ice to melt into the, there isn't any ice, really, permanent ice to melt into them. I don't believe, increased temperature of the water might uh, expand the body of water a little bit, but I don't know that it would make that big a difference to the lake. It will affect um, the, the water temperature. It could affect, I should say, the water temperature which will affect what, it, what fish can live in it. Trout need a real, trout have a real narrow band of temperature that they can tolerate. So if it goes above their band of tolerable temperatures, the trout won't, won't like the Great Lakes. And uh, so, so climate change could affect the, the makeup of the, the fauna and the flora. Yes? I, hear, I thought I heard on a program a while back that as the Niagara Falls are eroding backwards, our Lake Michigan are, are starting to drain faster. Hmm. No, I haven't heard that one. I have not heard that. The flow over falls is increasing due to the erosion of that from the action of the water and will drain faster. I have not heard that. Any other questions? Great questions. Thank you. Nothing else? Yes. <laughs> well, I, um, you know, I'm not, I'm not what, what my nephew calls a rock biter. <laughs> People, uh, some geologists actually bite rocks to help, under, to help determine what they are. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I'm, not a, I'm not a rock hound as much as I am fascinated by the processes. You know, how did this shape get here? How did this canyon get here? You know, how did, the, uh, how did this waterfall get here? What, what formed it? So it's the processes, the geologic processes that I'm fascinated by, and that just comes from my love of what I see in Wisconsin. I've always wanted, to, always gone out and explored in the wilds of Wisconsin and Minnesota um, in other areas of the country, but um, mostly Wisconsin. So it was that, and I got training as a science writer. Uh, I didn't have the attention span of, to be a scientist. <laughs> But I, but I love to read about science and write about it. So that's those two things, I guess, are what came together to make me want to do this. Yes? Are there many students pursuing geology these days? I don't know. I don't know what the reality is. Yes, there, are. there are. Good. 
there still are. There's a, there's a nice program at St. Cloud State University. There's another nice program. I think it's Stevens Point. Yeah. I'm not sure. Yeah. I went to St. Cloud State. Yeah. Winona State, too, maybe? I'm not sure. But Joe was, uh, Ma UW Madison. Madison was probably that. Yeah. And as River a, Falls had um, a major at one time. But I don't know what the enrollment trends are. I really don't know. Good question. Anybody else? Thank you.